The Windcastle effect is a description of a phenomena that was observed that relates how reservoirs can affect the pulsatile nature of fluid flow. This was originally described in the context of a fire truck and an air uh, and an air reservoir, hence the name wind kessel, right? A vessel of wind. Um, but it actually has a strong relationship to modeling the cardiovascular system because the same concept of a reservoir that it allows for capacitance and storage of the fluid also applies to the compliance of the aorta, for example, as it receives blood out of the heart. And so let's think about the heart for a moment. And let's say we have blood flowing out of the heart as it's getting pumped through the aorta. Now this happens on some regular frequency. And there'll be beats when during systole where it contracts and then times in between when it relaxes. So we're talking about a pulsatile flow. Right, something that will continue to pulse and beat. And so if you were if you were pushing this through a rigid pipe, a pipe that has no flexibility whatsoever, what you would see is pulses where the fluid would flow. And then when the heart stopped pumping, the fluid would stop. And without the valves, the fluid would flow backwards. But there are, you know, things like the aortic valve, which gate that process and prevent backflow. I wrote the, I put that backwards. It's actually more like this. Let's use a different color. And so in a rigid pipe where a one-way valve here, they represented the aortic valve, right? Aortic valve. It pulses, fluid flows, the valve shuts, and, and, flu, and flow stops. And then the heart pumps again, and flow goes, and then it stops. Once it shuts again, and on and on. So extremely pulsatile flow. That's what you would see if the aorta was a rigid, fixed pipe. But it's not. The aorta actually has compliance, and the the mathematical uh, the the mathematical representation of that is capacitance for an electronic component and you can model it as such so every time that the heart pumps the aorta will dilate because the pressure that's being pushed against it will actually lead to elastic stretching of the walls That stretching means that more blood is being supported or absorbed in here. And then there's a bunch of potential energy that's being created and stored because of the elastic stretchiness of the aorta that's now under tension because it's absorbed and, and increased in diameter relative to where it normally would be without the pressure. So what happens now when the heart stops contracting the valves close, and we now have all this tension, but no pressure. What's going to happen is that in diastole, we're going to find ourselves with a stretched aorta that is then going to collapse back in because there's no more pressure back here pushing 
these open. And because of the one-way valve of the aortic valve, there's only one way for that flow to go. And that flow is going to go this way again. And so even though we're in diastole, blood is still flowing forward. Now, it's not flowing forward as quickly as it does in systole when the heart is contracting. And that's why you feel your pulse, right? Your pulse represents the difference in pressure and fluid flow that's seen during systole and diastole. But the rate of fluid flow under under diastole is not zero. It is something meaningful. But there is a change in rate here because there are changes in pressure. The aorta cannot constrict back and stretch back to its original, um, resist the stretch back at the original shape and lead to the same type of pressure that is generated when the heart contracts, not even close. But it, that pressure is enough, that stretchiness, that collapsing of the stretchiness is enough to create some pressure that still pushes blood forward. And so if you were to try to plot this, right, time versus pressure, every pulse that you get, right, after every contraction, oops, let's actually write this correctly, your pulse goes up and down and up and down. And really what you're talking about is this number up here for a healthy individual being around 120, if we're measuring this in millimeters of mercury, and this number being 80. And that's where 120 over 80 comes from. The, the total amount of pressure in the circulatory system, partially due to the contraction and falling and, and collapsing of the aorta, continuing to push blood forward, leads to a minimum diastolic pressure of 80. And in a healthy individual, the peak of the systolic pressure is 120. And that's why these terms are called systolic pressure and diastolic pressure. Now we're interested in trying to understand how we can model this behavior of the aorta stretching and contracting in relation to the pressure being applied or not being applied from the heart as it contracts. That's what the Winkessel model actually takes a look at. And it turns out that the act of stretching in this fashion is, has properties of being a capacitor, right? That's what, that's what it means to be compliant. So if we were to try to model this as a full circuit, we would model the heart itself some kind of voltage source. Let's pretend for simplicity's sake, it's some AC sine wave voltage source, positive here, negative here. And then let's wire it to a couple of things. This is going to be what we're going to call this the two element model. This was one of the first models of the cardiovascular system was a two element model. There's also a three element model and a four element, mo four element model and it gets a lot more complicated. But this is the two element model where the component, there's two components in the process. This is not part of it, this is the heart. And the first component is the capacitor. The second component is the resistor. These are put in parallel. We'll explain why in a moment. And this is connected. We're going to write this out to a ground. So if we were to categorize these components, this represents the heart. And this represents the aorta. And there are two components that we're modeling the aorta with. This, the aorta here has some 
We'll call this V of, v of T because it's a changing voltage. This is going to be a capacitor C. This is going to be a resistance R. And the reason there is some resistance R is because any fixed diameter tube, right? So any tube, any pipe has some resistance, right? Something has to dictate what the flow through the aorta is going to look like. And that's primarily modeled by the resistor. However, there's another component here. Because without, without a resistor, right, we can't define flow. You, you know, the, if you wire this up without a resistor and you just have a wire going here, then you have a short. And this has effectively infinite current flowing through it. That's not a meaningful model. So resistance is critical to understanding and putting some, some physiological sort of boundaries on the flow that we're describing. The capacitor here represents the compliance, right? The stretchiness of the aorta. And that makes sense because when the aorta stretches, it absorbs more blood per square per centimeter of aorta than would normally be present without that extra pressure. And so this C term, right, this, this capacitor represents the ability, right, literally the capacity for the aorta to absorb that extra blood when the pressure increases, and which makes sense because that is literally the behavior of a capacitor. It takes on more fluid in the, in the water analogy or more charge, right? It accepts more charge when more voltage, in this case, pressure is applied. And so this two-component model well describes the aorta, at least in a very simple sense. More complicated models do more. And when you want to get really complicated, you end up modeling every small segment of an, of a, of an artery and having multiple two or three or four element models, each with their own resistance, capacitance, values, and so that you properly understand how they all interact if you were to simulate it all. So this is the basics. This is the Windkessel model and the Windkessel effect uh, looked at in two elements.